Weber, you want to go ahead and give an update to everyone? Yeah, so, so the lab, we finally got some power back. Uh, so one of the things that I wanted to show you guys today was uh, uh, the update on the lab view front, because uh, what we were able to uh, capture the other day with uh, Vijay was that uh, we were able to, uh, he was able to program a lab view software, which uh, uh, helps in calibration quite a bit. And uh, it's much easier and straightforward to maneuver the timings on the lab view software and sort of uh, time it better and calibrate the system. Uh, that's pretty much the key to the entire system. Uh, Anul, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, using this makes uh, things much more easier. You know, we have learned quite a bit about how the system works just by looking at what's happening on the lab view uh, panel. Uh, the earlier simulation that we were trying that was based on Python, I think we never got it working. So I'm glad we have this uh, the test bench. Uh, you want to give a quick run through or later? Yeah. So, so what we have is here, here is our uh, sensor that's online. So it's continuously measuring oxygen levels. Uh, let me show you, uh, make this 18, so it's showing, that's your ambient oxygen at 20.9% concentration. And uh, to verify, we have a second uh, meter over here that's connected in line. So that's showing 20.9. So these two agree with each other. They are in ambient. I hook it up to my system. And... Uh, so here's the, here's the lab view panel. Essentially, it's got a start and a stop here. It's got a settings where you set the COM port for your Arduino. Uh, you also set the IO pin numbers for your valve A, valve B, and uh, the equalization valve. So pins five, six, and seven is what we have now. In some cases, your relay board could be either an active low or an active high. So you can set that from here. And uh, finally, the calibration values for your oxygen sensor. So, you know, at India, we are getting 14 millivolts, and at uh, 98.6, we are getting 70 millivolts. So, we plugged in those values over here. With that done, what we have here is a graph of your oxygen level over here in terms of concentration. We have the on off switching cycle of the three solenoid valves. And we can set these on the fly. So I can make it like, let's say 1500. And uh, it kind of adjusts in real time. That if you can hear the timings, it's become much faster here. So that's, so that's my save charge uh, or production timing. I can make it back to 4,000, like so. And you can also set your uh, flush timing and your pre-chart timings. And for some reason, if you want to operate the valves manually, you have an auto manual switch that lets you uh, switch the valves on and off. So, so I don't know if you guys can see that. Uh, I'm sorry, but we I can't share the screen on this, but We'll, uh, we are recording this. Huh? We are recording this. We are recording this so we can share that later. Yeah. Uh, apart from that, uh, yeah. So one, of course, the uh, biggest update is, uh, yes. Uh, the, the, uh, we have ninety percent uh, at around between ten to fifteen LPM. We have ninety percent between ten to fifteen LPM. Yeah, hoping to crank that up with the larger sieves and a few other things. We've uh, also built the second prototype, if you see over here, which uh, is the aluminum casing. And thanks to uh, Gorba for uh, sending us the sieves. We're using that. We will need one more cylinder, Gorba. You're here in the call, so we need one more machine uh, to be able to add the uh, desiccant chamber, which you're putting over here. This is to basically take out the moisture from the air. 
Uh, yeah. Okay, we can go around the table. Uh, if anyone has any updates or anyone wants to talk, uh, then after that, we can uh, try again. Yeah, go ahead, Vivan. Um, currently, what is the kind of humidity that you're uh, getting in the system? So ambient humidity is about 80, 85% over here. Last we checked, reached up to about 90. And currently, we're getting one second. We brought it down under 10. OK, and uh, how did you manage it? Yeah, one, of course, uh, the mush, yeah. So one is the, so basically the air comes directly so in, goes into 83 percent right now. 80, ambient is 83. Around roughly 83. And uh, what we have is uh, this comes from the compressor, the main line okay. that goes to a cooling coil that we've kind of temporarily put it in a bucket of water. In a bucket of water, okay. And uh, that goes to a secondary cooling coil. And from there, it goes to the primary moisture separator, the pressure drop over here. And uh, that's, I think, a bunch of uh, two of them, the coalescing filter and inline filter. <coughs> from there, we are piping it into this sieve over here, which contains uh, alumina-based uh, 13x uh, desiccant, which absorbs moisture. Okay. And it's also filled with some sort of uh, activated charcoal. So there's about 75% uh, aluminum 13x for desiccant and uh, some out of 25% of char charcoal. That output goes to our uh, high pressure regulator and from there it goes into the, uh, the two valves. Uh, we have a bleed valve over here through which we can measure the humidity that goes into the uh, sieve chamber. So we can put the humidity sensor but yes, uh, this is obviously not optimized yet. Yeah. Yeah. So we can use the humidity sensor and place it here and measure the humidity that's in the air that's going into the uh, sieve chamber. So that's that's kind of how we are doing it at the moment. Yeah, because we brought down 90% to about 5% humidity. So that, that's a really great uh, achievement, actually. So yeah, because you want to get the humidity out of the system. Get this. This is eighty-three percent humidity. Eighty-three right now. Mm. Okay. And uh, yeah, once I turn on the compressor, but it'll be too yeah. noisy. So I think in production, yeah. what would be a good idea would be uh, this coil isn't big enough. So we're going to have to make a bigger coil that is essentially this whole copper tube that we have in this uh, water can over here. And uh, I think with some uh, good uh, fan cooling, it should be good enough, I guess. Yeah. Yep. Okay. But, like Maybe. right now, we are not even cooling this water. It's just regular water that's been lying here for the last two, I think, uh, two days. We haven't changed the water. So, it's so uh, here's an interesting uh, fact. Okay. Uh, if you're doing this test in the night, you might get a different result from morning. Uh, I agree on that. Yeah. I yeah. Think so we should record that as well. So good point on you know making those uh, measurements uh, as well well we had bigger problems here i think uh, i don't know if you can see there's a generator lying around here we got power about an hour back and up until now we were fighting with a cyclone uh, yeah and water and basic necessities <laughs> yes so so you guys need to build a wind uh, like a like a wind generator next time around i mean like <laughs> Maybe, yeah, but, yeah. In the cyclone, it would have worked, but after the cyclone, in the aftermath, there was no air over here, so we were no sleeping. wind. I mean, there was air, no wind at yeah, all. Yeah, no wind at all. Uh, so uh, very uh, tough nights. Uh, yep. Without uh, no fans. I've been sleeping in the car because <laughs> I mean, at least some. Oh my God. <laughs> some humidity control and temperature control inside the car instead of the room. yeah last two nights a lot we're looking forward to sleeping tonight yeah <laughs> anyways <laughs> all right uh arjun do you want to say something yeah yeah since we were talking about humidity firstly congratulations on <laughs> like doing all of this yeah <laughs> yeah um 
I saw a lot of conversation about using Peltier modules. Right. So like, but like, since I don't have a prototype in front of me, it's difficult for me to gauge how much is required. So it does no, that no, seem no, no, feasible? Peltier is, well, they can definitely cool. They also extract so much of heat that you have to uh, have active cooling on the hot side as well to, to take that heat away. Otherwise, it's not going to work. You need also, a heat sink, yes. Yeah, also, yeah, heat sinks and then some, you know, maybe a fan. So that, and they suck a lot of power. So that's one thing. The other thing is, uh, uh, like, they're not all that easily available, right? And if they are, they're kind of expensive. So I think in the long run, we... I think it's not a solution that will work for this case at least. If you're trying to keep the cost down, then I think Peltier isn't going to be the way out, for sure. Okay, okay thanks so, for the input. So I think you know this uh, combination of uh, a really large uh, copper cooling coil with a, a desiccant sieve might do the trick for all of us, I think. Yeah, a desiccant chamber, a desiccant sieve would actually be yeah. pretty exciting because th that way you can just easily replace it. Yeah. So you can have it run for a month and just replace the desiccant chamber, uh, especially in humid spaces, and you won't need that in dry spaces. So it's just and, an add-on module. Yeah. And since we already have like these three PVC tanks, just adding a fourth small tank, it's like it's not that much of an addition. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know. Absolutely. It fits perfectly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like just making two of the search tanks. Just fill one with a desiccant, the other one is a search tank. So, uh, uh, build-wise, it's pretty straightforward. That's perfect. Minimize complexity. Yeah. Yeah. So now, you know, I think from, if there's any from anyone from sourcing who's here on the call today, we need to figure out a good way of getting uh, a water absorbent desiccant zeolite, whatever it's called. I think it's 13 x aluminum, whatever it is. We need to source those. Praveen is there? No, Praveen. Uh, these are, I think, about uh, about 2 mm diameter balls, right? Yeah, the 2 mm. Yeah, so they were about uh, larger than the other zeolite that we are using and slightly darker in shade. And much cheaper. Hopefully, yeah. But this is not the activated alumina thing, right? Like when you say 13x, it's a different or the same as the activated uh, alumina? Oh, um, sorry for that confusion, but we ourselves aren't sure what exactly it is, but it's essentially like the guy who came uh, uh, gave it to us he is kind of an expert on this he is, runs a dive center so for them getting uh, dry air is extremely important so he knows everything about psa and you know uh, desiccants and all that he gave us a cylinder of air that's like uh, five percent humidity or even less so we can use that to calibrate our oxygen sensors he also gave us a cylinder that's 99 98.6 percent purity for oxygen so that guy said uh, they use it uh, quite, uh, I mean, they use it a lot for their work and uh, it, it really works and it doesn't have to be replaced very often. So uh, I think we're going to have to uh, check with him on which particular grade it is or what it is. So I think he did fortunately make... or unfortunately, I think I'll, I have both. I have the 13X one, which you're talking about. Uh -huh. uh, and I'll also be having the activated alumina soon. So. Nice. Okay. So apparently, I think this is from uh, Sorbid uh, in Baroda. It's either Sorbid or uh, what is that? Silly. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, silicon. 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 So it's either uh, from Sorbid or Silicon. And both of these are in Baroda, I think. So yeah, same. Yeah. Uh, let's follow up with the mask then that we want to have moisture capture uh, sieve. So what would they recommend? I think that'll be our best bet. Another possible way to possibly do this is based uh, 13x, right? Same thing, some similar. Yeah, but if you can find a material that is more absorbent for H2O, yeah, that's better. That'll be even better, right? True. So I think most of the folks should have 13x1 because I think mistakenly previously what we got, most of the folks got mm. was a 13x1, which uh, is like the in, even the diameter wise was larger. So. Yeah. That should also work in the beginning. Yeah, I guess so. That should also kind of work, I guess. Do the job. Yeah. I mean, uh, worth giving it a shot. Just build another sieve tank, fill it with uh, 13x and we'll see how it goes. All right. Anyone else? Uh, I just want to point out one thing, okay? Uh, if you looked at the Tata's uh, 
uh, the, the, the design, right? Yeah. The coil, what they had, they it had the uh, like a large, bigger diameter diameter at the top. Yeah, it was uh, a good coil. Made sense actually because of the hot air being kept away from the cold air. Right. So yeah, that will be a good. Uh, so they, that basically makes a big difference. Uh, I was trying to do some uh, like CFD on it, but my uh, system crashed. But uh, there was some documentation which says that design has basically a, a better uh, a Reynolds number and so on uh, to basically dissipate the heat uh, better. So yeah. So uh, the tricky mm -hmm. thing would be how do you wind it? Maybe you need a, a kind of a former on which you wind it, or you wind a parallel coil and then kind of you know taper it out somehow. Uh, yeah, but I think having a having a former on which to just wind it would be the easiest. Uh, what else? Or we could just uh, yeah, we'll have to build one sort of a basic more. It's like a power. mandrel on which you can wind yeah. that coil. One jig needs to be made, yeah. and then after, jig, that, yeah. Yeah. then after that, it should be easy to. Continuously make yeah, yeah, yeah. That should not be very difficult to make. I mean, you can get it done in a lathe shop on a, on yeah, wood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It can be a wooden thing, or I don't know if we or can fiberglass or whatever. Yeah, or maybe if we can find one of those uh, traffic cones and use those something like that. Traffic cone would be a great idea. Yeah, that might work as well. Yeah, but traffic cones uh, because it's plastic, it'll it it'll tend to uh, bend. I mean, it may not be strong enough to. Or do the we coil can, on it. We can fill the hollow part with, with concrete. With concrete or something like that. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yes. Yeah. So I think there are ways of, uh, I think, cheap ways of doing that. So it shouldn't be a big problem, I think, on that. Part. Krishna, go ahead. Hey, guys. So, uh, I mean, uh, what you've done is a very inspiring work to have achieved uh, despite the odds and, you know, especially in humidity, which encourages us a lot. Um, so I have uh, some few questions. Like, first of all, how do we calibrate the uh, maximum point of O2 uh, uh, sensor uh, okay. without uh, using a cylinder? Because uh, finding cylinders uh, pretty much hard in general. Yeah. 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 So we thought of this, and there are I think two ways of uh, doing this. I'm not sure if uh, the first one I suggest is going to be good, but uh, one is if you suck out all oxygen from air and call that a 0%, you can calibrate 0% and 20.9%. Now, that's kind of easier said than done. You can you know, maybe uh, invert a glass or a candle and put it some water and let it burn out all the oxygen and do that stuff which you used to learn in, I think, you know, uh, school. Right. But uh, ideally, we are more keen on the 90s part of the calibration. Like the zero percent really doesn't really interest us uh, in terms of accuracy. So if we can get ninety or you know, eighty percent uh, oxygen, that will be great. So okay. another way of uh, generating a small amount of oxygen would be either to use hydrolysis to you know make a little amount of oxygen. Just make sure you vent all the hydrogen into a safe air, mm -hmm. and uh, see if we can use that. The third way is to have an electrochemical reaction that also releases oxygen. Okay, okay. Uh, I think one way or another, you're going to have to have a, a calibrated uh, standard to measure it to, I think. Uh, so I have a question here, Anul. So uh, yeah. see, like, uh, what I understand is like uh, at ambient air, it, it produces around 14 to 16 millivolts. Right. And at 100%, it's going to produce some millivolt, right? right. If I'm going to use that value that you got, uh, yeah. won't it work for me? Because you have calibrated with uh, hundred percent oxygen, right? Right. Uh, if I'm gonna use like, if it's like say sixty millivolts or sixty five millivolts, I'm not sure. Okay. If I'm gonna use that in my code, oh, won't it work the same way here? Uh, it might, but uh, okay. So yeah, I think there's a good idea in what you say. Uh, we take one sensor and calibrate it for twenty point nine percent and ninety eight point six percent, and uh, that gives us the slope of the uh, output characteristic. So that mm -hmm. is a constant. Now, after that, what varies is the uh, millivolt value in ambient. So uh, at 20.9%, uh, uh, it might sometimes be 14 millivolt, it might sometimes be 14.5 millivolt. And that keeps fluctuating every time. So you have to set that uh, back to uh, the, the right value. 
Okay. So, so once mm. that happens, the value at the far end of the scale also changes at ninety percent or ninety eight percent. So uh, we can actually, yeah, I think if we can characterize four or five sensors and see mm -hmm. what kind of uh, slope we get, if that slope is consistent, no matter what the actual values are. Mm -hmm. then all we need is one value at twenty point nine percent and the slope of the sensor. Uh, that should be enough for calibration, I think. Right, right. Okay. And I think that's okay. the exercise we can do, but we'll need some sensors. At the, at the moment, we have just one sensor and a standard. These are the only two ones we have. Or, uh, uh, like, probably I can uh, suggest something like, uh, oh, what if, like, uh, people in different labs, because they are in different locations with different sensors, I mean, the same model, right? Like, maybe we all can do the same thing, right? And share the charts. I mean, if that works, it, out. there could be a problem because this is electrochemical, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I'm assuming. I mean, uh, it might vary. So, so oh, yeah, okay. one thing we can do if we all have the same model of uh, sensor. For example, the double O one zero two, which has the phono jack. Okay. I think that's the most convenient one to use. And uh, if all of us have that, we can just measure the value it produces at twenty point nine percent concentration and uh, see what kind of uh, drift or spread we have okay and uh, so uh, you use 102 is it yep okay no the 102 uh -huh. is what came with our uh, standard instrument the oa10 from i think it was some delhi company uh -huh. and uh, what we have is the uh, 202 202 yeah uh, okay perfect then the one that has uh, the the molex connector yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah. That's the one we have. Yeah, super. So I guess I uh, let's, let's do that. Probably set up an online spreadsheet. Uh, we put the sensor uh, model number and the serial number of the sensor. Uh -huh. and Makes sense. The values in millivolt at 20.9. Sure. Yeah. And if anyone can get 98.6% uh, uh, oxygen, then add that value also. Like we are able to do that. So we'll add a, a column for that as well. But if anyone else okay. is able to do that, let's have that. So then we can have, you know, at least about eight, 10 sensors and see what kind of uh, variation we have between different ones. Cool. Yeah. Sounds good. Cool. Uh, I think this would be good to tabulate yeah. in the electronics GitHub folder. Yeah. 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 Can someone. Uh, Volunteer to do it. If I, if I have the data, I can put it in. Just so what you can do is set up a Google form. We fill in mm -hmm. the inputs, and it goes as a spreadsheet. Okay, I'll follow up with you on that on All what right. we need on the inputs. Okay. Yeah. Input may straightforward. Uh, model number, serial number, uh, millivolt at twenty point nine, and millivolt at uh, ninety eight point six. Okay. Okay. Got it. Um, so I, I have one more uh, question. So uh, is it possible to dry the zeolite without an oven, like say on a pan, like on, on a, like a stove or something? So we actually just put it in a microwave and turned on convection uh -huh. and microwave, both of uh, heating. And uh, did a, uh, I think what one? Huh? Yeah, but the results weren't that great actually. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, because it didn't give us anything better. Any spike, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. we were still getting the same result. Uh, rather, the oxygen concentration dropped by about 10 odd percent with the same parameters. Yeah, maybe it needed absorbing more moisture in that case. Yeah. So, uh, what's been recommended is putting it in, in a vacuum oven and to do it. Now, that's going to be impossible for all of us to do it. I need a vacuum oven. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's, uh, Vijay is actually testing that out in uh, Bangalore. Vacuum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but how many of us will have access to? Yeah. Uh, yeah that's but if that's, yeah, fair. So we have to kind of maybe work. in the dry places it could work. Yeah. At least not in Goa. So what we learned was it's important to handle the zeolite inside an air-conditioned room. At least uh, I mean we know it won't be dry completely, but at least it is a little bit controlled. Correct. Before uh, you put it into the sieve. So when you're putting it in the sieve, that time put it in an air-conditioned yeah, yeah. room. Yeah. And uh, might be a good idea to have some, uh, uh, let's say, ball cock valves to sh uh, shut off the sieves if they are being left uh, overnight uh, or something like that. So, moisture doesn't seep in. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Another thing, uh, guys, everyone, just be careful. Uh, this has been pointed a bunch of times. Uh, uh, zeolites are poisonous. So here's the thing. The zeolite is actually edible. You can eat it and it yep. won't really harm you if it goes into your tummy. But if it goes into your lung, it's definitely a carcinogen. So the dust mm-hmm. inhalation is dangerous. The granules themselves per se are really kind of inert. So not much can happen to you if you... You can eat them, but you can't smell them. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You can't smell them. Don't sniff them. (laughs) Don't don't snort them. Yeah. Um, uh, Guys, did uh, anyone face this issue before? Like, I am, uh, like, uh, after I uh, pressurize the system, I'm getting powder through the exhaust of, like, like, there's, like, fine zeolite powder that counts out through my exhaust. On the exhaust side? Outlet yeah, side. exhaust side. Yeah, exhaust side. Yeah, that's Into possible exhaust. if you haven't taken the dust out of the saves or putting it in, right? Yeah, yeah. If the particles have been right. crushed, so one way to do that is by uh, putting a vacuum uh, cleaner at the bottom when putting it in. That's right. what we've been doing. Yeah. yeah. So what we do is that uh, when filling up the saves at the bottom part, we put a vacuum cleaner attachment right here, so uh, all the dust gets out right away. While you're yeah putting it into the sieve, uh, and uh, fill it the, in small stages like yeah fill it in small stages couple of inches uh, put uh, some shaking then add some more then do some more shaking and so on. Pass that filter. Yeah, and one of these inline filters is a good idea at the end. Okay. Okay. Uh, we will need these full stop. But that'll be right at the output end. So yeah, that'll be at the output end. Yeah. So yeah. So if you like. Well, Don't breathe don't... that stuff that's coming out directly without a uh, inline filter. Okay. 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 Yeah. Uh, yeah, Vinod, there are more. You want to go ahead? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, regarding the sensor, right? Oxygen sensor, actually. Uh, I spoke with the technical team on any day. And they sent me one graph. Again, it is uh, so even if you have two data points, you can just put the straight line and put it the same. Voice is kind of sketchy. Uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, regarding the sensor, yeah. uh, what they are suggesting is, instead, of, if you are able to get even two data points, that is the ambient air and somewhere at a known concentration level. Right. And then they are telling, since it is a linear uh, output, you can just uh, plot a straight line between these two, then you will get your... Uh, Values correct. That is what they are telling. Yeah, I think uh, that makes sense, and that's what we are planning to do in any case because we can't have more than that in in terms of data points. Yeah, and the other thing, uh, what uh, Krishna was suggesting, like uh, one person cannot use the data of the other person because uh, since it is an uh, electrochemical sensor, mm. for each one, uh, the what is the millivolt value you get, it will be keeping on changing for each sensor. Right. Right. So uh, one person trying to use that for the other, it may not work out. Yeah, which is where the data collection might help to see what kind of uh, variation there is in the output between different sensors. Yeah, yeah, that has to be done. That is one thing. And the other thing which I noticed... My point is if the slope of the output is consistent between sensors, Hmm. then you can actually do calibration with a single point. Yeah. But if the slope is not consistent, then you definitely need two points for each sensor. Yeah. And uh, the other thing which I noticed uh, uh, from yesterday is, like, uh, what is the input uh, pressure or LPM of air you put it into the sensor, which the sensor comes in contact with? Why? Because if I am trying the sensor to put it with a directly compressed air at like 1 PSI and 2 PSI, Immediately, I'm getting a concentration like 30, 40, 60 percent, even up to 70 percent. I'm getting the more I increase the pressure, the more uh, the value is keeping on increasing the millivolt, even with a normal air. Yeah, so I think uh, there is a spec on what uh, amount of pressure it can withstand. I don't think it can apply a lot over atmospheric pressure. So, what we have done is we've got this uh, 3D printed uh, T made. So it's an inline uh, T measurement. Here is a sensor over here. Yeah. Oh, no. Now the point comes to if you are calibrating it at a particular LPM. Yeah. Then at the same LPM only you should be testing on the system also. Calibration at a different LPM is going to be different than testing on the system at a different LPM. Mm. 
Okay. Uh, that's interesting. I don't know about that, but if we show that part. This one? Uh, no, this one. This is another thing that we're putting before that, right? Yeah. So we've actually added one of these before okay. where we are sort of, con uh, so even if that's it's tricky. at uh, 10 LPM, we're reducing uh, the air inflow into the sensor to just a minimal amount, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, when you're getting the higher concentrations it's, uh, and lower concentrations, we were still using yeah. this. I think you definitely want to avoid a high pressure on the sensor. It's going to yeah. spoil it for sure. High pressure on the sensor will definitely spoil it, yeah. But this <clears throat> would really help in restricting the flow into the sensor. So this is the one that we got, Compomedic. Okay. I'm not able to get the model number. Oh, eight ten. Oh, eight ten. Okay, I got it. Okay. Someone can take a screenshot of this. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Company is a compromedic instruments in Delhi. Okay. But uh, quite frankly, it's no different from the instrument that we have made. It's got a three D printed uh, kind of a stand at the back, and uh, it does have a self calibrate feature, which is kind of nice. Yeah, which is also easy for us to do in code, really. Yeah. Uh, okay. And you just leave yeah. the sensor in air for a little while, and whatever okay. many volts it's reading, you uh, assign a, a figure of 20.9 to it. Fair. Okay. You're done with the calibration. And it costs uh, 10 times uh, <laughs> more expensive than buying just the oxygen sensor. Yeah. Okay. This thing was like 28,000 rupees for us. Compared <laughs> to an oxygen sensor, yeah. So not the best purchase. <laughs> okay. Uh, and the uh, other thing about the uh, uh, zeolite, which Krishna was telling uh, about the powder coming out, uh, people have to take care on that side also in the exhaust mainly. Uh, why? Because there are instances where your uh, pneumatic wall uh, gets uh, jammed actually. Jammed up, yeah. That's because true. of the uh, dust going in. That's right. Uh <laughs> Uh, because already uh, what we are pushing, there might be some moisture also. So what will happen uh, when we uh, depressurize, normally condensation is happening. Mostly if you have felt the three by two walls, uh, yeah. most of the time you might have seen it is cold actually. Yeah. So what will happen? Condensation might happen there so that uh, we'll start facing uh, the issue of sticky walls oh, actually. This is a good one what we did actually. So what yeah. we did with the, with the aluminum sieves is uh, we don't have any springs in it at all. We have a couple of these uh, steel wool, uh, whatever, washing thingies. Yeah. For cleaning vessels. So we have, I think, two of these. Okay. And uh, the Scotch Bright pad that you saw scouring. Okay. Like using a laser. Uh, <laughs> this one, I think, exo, whatever. Yeah. yeah. So this is the filter, and uh, this is the spring. Okay. And works quite well. At least with the aluminum uh, sieves. Uh, with PVC, we haven't yet tried it. It's a different kind of construction. With uh, aluminum, it is much easier to just use these uh, without any springs. Okay. Okay. I got it. I got it. And uh, that's the setup in which we have got the 92% uh, uh, values, in fact. Okay, okay. Uh, because with the oxygen sensor, what is the issue I faced is, uh, yesterday we started our mission for the first time with the loading zeolite, and uh, immediately I was able to get up to 50% of O2 okay. uh, with, my, with my sensor. Uh, but I was a little bit doubtful because I have, I have not done any tuning or anything. Then I found out like even if I put it with the compressed air, like a little bit more pressure, it is showing some higher values right. than it is normally is. Got you. Uh, so I've reached out to the technical team at NVTech, so I might get a response by tomorrow. Okay. So we'll see what is the nominal pressure should be and what should be the LPM. Sorry, whom did you reach out to? The technical team at? Uh, NVTech. Uh, they are the manufacturer of the Sunnywell sensor, NVTech. Got you. Yeah. A couple of, sorry, just a margin uh, regarding this issue, a couple of uh, specs that I've checked, the technical documentation I've checked for sensors is you have to first check the pressure. Usually it's around one bar. You have to check the pressure. And the secondly, you cannot use the full flow. Yeah. You cannot use the full flow. You need to take say 0.2 to 0.3 LPM uh, from the main flow and then give oxygen there. So that will solve the problem of inconsistent readings at random pressure and high LPMs. 
True. Which is where a man like this is really useful. Exactly. Exactly. So that's what you would. Uh, that's a good solution to that. Yeah. Uh, and a cup. Uh, yeah. It's great that you are addressing. Actually, the point I wanted to make was great that you are addressing the uh, intake air air humidity issue because that is going to be a deal breaker. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, in conditions in India, coastal cities. Uh, yeah. Pollution in the in the major cities. Uh, oil pollutants. Yeah, so, we got we got reached out by a hospital in Goa that wants to donate us three thousand oxygen concentrators for free, so that we can do something about them because they don't work <laughs> in the humidity in Goa. <laughs> I've, I've checked. I've checked some of the one of the major uh, oxygen concentrator vendor in US, uh, ten liter per seven liter per minute, and then he says tests were done. Normal testing was done at uh, zero uh, relative humidity and wow. clean air. Wow. That's, so, uh, that's really because these things will work for a day, and then second or third day, they'll be saturated with all kinds of garbage and humidity, and we'll be left with junk. Can we? I call that cheating, right? <laughs> yeah. Can we guys not retrofit those uh, oxygen concentrators? Like uh, we know how to fix the problem, right? Like, can you guys not thinking in those lines? Like, actually, uh, we can. Yeah, but once we figure out the entire. Yeah. Uh, solution now, right? Yeah. So that's what we are all working towards. I mean, one part of if, if it is actually making these, but also educating and learning as to exactly how the system works, so we can optimize them. True. Oh so, yeah, totally. Uh, one of the, one of the yeah. things that came to my mind was regarding your. Uh, uh, I think you mentioned using a vacuum cleaner to suck up the dust before uh, you know packing is realized. Uh, in the same vein, uh, maybe you could use a hair dryer and then you know dry out your ZLA before, uh, at the same time while you are sucking in sucking the dust out. Then you will dry out your ZLA with the hair dryer. Maybe put it in a pipe, put a hair dryer at one end, vacuum on the other. Uh, so what we have been told is uh, for the ZLA to actually release all the moisture, it needs to be baked at some 500 odd degrees for 15 hours or something like that. So it's like. It doesn't give away that moisture very easily. It really likes to hold on to it. So, so you, need, of, you need a tandoor or something. Sorry? You need a tandoor. You need to put yeah. it in a Something like that. And it has to be in vacuum more or less. Otherwise, it's not going to release the, the moisture. So it's kind of tricky, you know, forcing it to give away that moisture. Also, right. hair dry, what is it going to do? Hair dry will give you hot air, but will it also take out the humidity? No, right? Not for because it's only for a few seconds that each grain is getting that heat. So yeah. So what's going to end up happening is that you're going to end up absorbing, I think, more humidity, yeah. and that's sort of I think what happened when we put it in the microwave. The other thing is these uh, grains are pretty like they're like uh, uh, polystyrene balls. They have a lot of static in them. They kind of stick and cling if you uh, uh, when it's fresh out of the uh, bag. So. Even when we're trying to fill it through the funnel, it, it, they tend to jump around a lot. Uh, so, applying any, you know, hot air, yeah, hot air they'll air kind of go, go all over the place, I, I'm guessing. Yeah. And uh, when we put it in the microwave, right? When we put it in the microwave, you need to keep bringing it out and shaking it. Yeah. And when you shake it, it I think that's when it absorbs the maximum amount of moisture mm. because it's hot and it's absorbing most a lot of moisture. And then you put it back into the heater. So same thing, I think, with the hair dryer. The moment you heat them, right. one, they're going to jump around a lot. And then secondly, they'll be uh, also the moment they start cooling down, they'll be absorbing a lot of the moisture. Yeah. Uh, which might be tricky, but if a controlled environment is created, like a vacuum chamber or something, then you can try. Uh, maybe then it might be effective. Yeah, effective. But I mean, a vacuum pump is a serious piece of machinery it's yeah vacuum pump cheap. works vacuum pump is pretty good uh air conditioned uh, environment that was pretty good i think um, one thing i wanted to tell was like see uh, the um, uh, oxygen uh, uh, oximeter test that you guys are doing uh, that's uh, considering it to be 20.9 uh, in the ambient uh, uh, level right yeah, yeah. So this uh, particular level is at sea level. So I believe there are guys working in different uh, uh, cities and uh, at different uh, heights. So for like, for example, if it is a thousand feet above sea level, the concentration goes down to 20.1. Yeah. 
Agreed. Well, well, if they, if anybody tries to use this twenty point nine value to do the calibration at uh, uh, Ambient, it will not work. If they don't have a, a meter and then try to do it, so there will be a huge difference in what they are trying to achieve. I think that makes complete sense. So I guess, uh, Artin, whatever uh, form you are making to capture sensor data, we should have that as a column as well. What's your either your altitude or your ambient uh, uh, pressure? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That, that is yeah. That's yeah. Uh, definitely uh, the better way to go. Yeah. I'll I'll go through this call once again the recording later so I can know everything because okay. I've been making the form on the side. Oh. Anyone else uh, before we call it? Because uh, we all need some sleep tonight. Sure. <laughs> um, obviously last. <laughs> guys, I have a quick question. So, uh, why exactly does zeolite uh, jump around? Like, is it because of heat or moisture? Static. No, I think it's like, you know, statically charged, I guess. I'm guessing because I saw that it literally happened in front of my eyes. But uh, once it's absorbed some moisture and all, it stops doing that. So, it's like a fresh peat that does that. Okay, yeah, okay. Also, because of the fact that it's just packed with a lot of nitrogen inside the bag. Like, it's totally dry. It's totally dry and it's just, uh, yeah. yeah, shake it up. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. You, uh, use the medical gloves. I mean, yeah. 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 Because it was actually. Yeah, I mean, why was it on my hand? for a whole day because he kind of you know, stuck it in. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, that, that's another uh, important thing. If you stick your hand inside the zeolite, it definitely sucks out all the moisture in your hand. And it can actually give you skin burns. Uh, my hand was witness to that. <laughs> I put my hands in because there was a clump of it. And uh, for a very long time, I it felt like I'm having some skin burns. Uh, yeah, same here. Yeah, that's what I want to do. Oh, Thank yeah, you. Gloves are a good idea. For gloves sure. are a good idea. Let's, uh, Krishna, actually, let's put some of these safety checks as well for people somewhere. Yeah. Start documenting some of these safety checks. What do you say? Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, makes sense. Of course, yeah. I think we should do that. Yeah. My hands too many times, so let's just start putting that down every time we burn. So, it. Uh, so I have a question. So this uh, a GitHub repo uh, is it uh, possible to add stuff in there? Uh, I mean, uh, is it possible to get access as a collaborator or something like, or is it open? Yeah, I think uh, Arjun, you do you have? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you can you can fork it and just make pull requests. It should be pretty easy. Okay. Um, in terms of collaborate access, I think that's something you guys at Makers Asylum would manage. I can add people as a maintainer, so that's not a problem for sure. Mm -hmm. But, the, uh, but uh, the, the, the pull, the, the easier workflow is someone forks it, makes changes, and sends a pull request, and they pull it in. Yeah. Okay. Definitely, definitely add you guys as uh, managers. That's not a problem. Uh, about the uh, safety issue. Uh, I got COVID because of sourcing and helping others. Oh, wow. So oh, damn. please take care of that. Uh, you are not wearing a mask right now. And in the makers also, I haven't seen you guys are working very closely. Point yeah. to be noted, point to be circulated. All those young people out there who want to make things work. I got COVID, uh, but uh, you guys take uh, care. And I think another thing everyone needs to remember, if you already got in COVID, you can get it again. Don't let your guard down. True. I think that's... Completely agree with you guys. Yeah. I also got it last year uh, when uh, working on the M19 Shields. This time, again, uh, most of us are living over here uh, within like either at Makers Asylum or at, again, designated houses just as yes, last year. So nobody's really leaving, but I completely agree with you that even if you're stepping out to buy materials and everything, that's how I, I think even I got it. And I was in contact with a lot of doctors because you were doing a bunch of research. And uh, yeah, very important to do that. Also, Jeez. please document that so no one wants key, the knowledge that anyone has acquired and then he gets COVID. That knowledge is very, he would then like, if he hasn't documented that, so that would go all lost. 100%. Yep, for sure. All right, how's uh, everyone else doing? Anyone have any updates? Something interesting, exciting? We have had a terrible three days, so. Uh, Anul, uh, uh, about the uh, the board yeah. uh, which we were discussing, uh, uh, I think we should have a separate meeting with the people who are um, actively involved uh, in, a, in, uh, in, in the schematic. Sure. Because I don't think everybody would be able to collaborate yeah. on that. 
Yeah, yeah. Let's so keep it small. We form form a, a smaller uh, team who yeah. can actually uh, put in more ideas. That's true. Let's keep it small. Let's keep it tight so it becomes uh, faster and better. I think. Okay. I think I'll talk to you directly and then I will try to yeah. uh, clear that. Power, we have power. We have power here, no? Hopefully. All right. So, it looks like things are back online from tonight. So, maybe tomorrow we can do the call, hopefully. Okay. You can set up our time and send out a Zoom invite and we can do it. Yeah. That's if we think it's going to be one, an hour long. If it's going to be longer, we can use the Asylum account. We have a pro account that allows us to go longer. Okay. Uh, once we uh, once you finalize uh, who uh, you would uh, prefer to be in the team, okay. Then uh, maybe um, uh, M19 itself can uh, send out an invite okay. to the the short team. All right, I can do that for sure. Okay. Yep. yep. Awesome. Um, I, I've awesome. just commented the form in the comments, so in the chat. So if you want to have a look and. Tell me any modifications you like. Uh, let's capture the chat as well. So yeah, let's look at that uh, sensor data. All the stuff is fine. Just yeah, take it. I'll just check it out. Just put just, the link. Just uh, look at it right now, right? Model number, other, fine. Serial number, output, ambient, okay. Output, concentrated, okay. But people might not have this. Yeah, yeah which is why the next one is. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to retain percent. Yeah. Yeah. I think... Lab name. Oh, yeah. Lab name. Yep. Uh, lab name and uh, coordinator name or something like that. Yeah. Be important. That's in the second section. Take it. Scroll down. Oh, there's the next one, is it? So, yeah. Okay. There's the next page. Take it. Okay. All right. Maybe uh, you can share this with Richa as well once. Yeah, I just posted also in electronics, so we can check it out from there. Put the link. Yeah. Yeah, I'll post it in the Telegram groups. Perfect. Also, I just wanted to, uh, before I forget, uh, the lab view uh, testbed that I showed you. The way it's running is uh, there is a lab view code in the Arduino. The Arduino doesn't have any of the timing code on it. So, it's a lab view that's uh, setting the timings uh, in real time and sending them over serial port to the Arduino. So uh, that code is a little bit different. Also, installing the lab view is a little bit of a, uh, a difficult task. So I will probably you know walk you through that uh, in a different uh, meetup or video later on. So yeah, that's it. Uh, there's some small minor updates to be made to it, and then we should be able to release the EXE. Unfortunately, it only works on Windows, so Mac and Linux users will have to make do with Windows, <laughs> which is my problem because I use Linux, so I've had to borrow some other computer to do that, but it works. All right, guys, uh, can you call it a night? You can take this form as well from Arjun. Yeah, I'm just going to save the chat. Thanks, Arjun. I'll just save that. So thank you. Everyone. You're very welcome. Thank you, everyone, for joining. We'll uh, catch up again uh, tomorrow. I'll try to schedule some more uh, specific calls with the lab coordinators um, and also the engineering group separately, maybe. That'll be more helpful. But thank you so much for joining tonight. See you soon. Bye. Oh, thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, we have a lot of technical to care. Well, I'll take care.